Welcome back to part two of crossing the plasma membrane. Remember that a plasma membrane surrounds body cells, and this membrane is made up of lipids, like phospholipids and cholesterol. The plasma membrane is also made up of proteins, which have many functions, one of them being to serve as membrane transporters, to move molecules and ions across the membrane. These transport proteins can be subdivided into several different categories. The first are channels. One type of channel is the leak channel. Leak channels don't have any gates and are always open. Other channels have gates. Some gates on channels are opened by a ligand, which is a chemical binding to them, and these are called ligand-gated channels. Other gated channels, called voltage-gated channels, are opened at certain membrane voltages and are important in cells that transmit electricity or respond to electrical signals. Other gated channels are mechanically gated and are opened with stretching or compressing of the membrane. Another type of transport protein are carrier proteins. Carriers have sites that bind to specific solutes or ions. Once the solute binds, the carrier protein changes shape, allowing the solute to move across the membrane. Imagine a revolving door. As these doors turn, they are open to either the inside of the building or the outside, but are never open to both sides at the same time. The same is true for carrier proteins. The binding of the solute causes the protein to change shape and open to the opposite side of the membrane. Important examples of carrier proteins are uniporters, symporters, antiporters, and ATP-powered pumps. It's important to remember that all the different types of channels and carrier proteins are specific for what they transport. For example, potassium leak channels will only let potassium cross through them and not sodium or anything else. Channels and carriers can also become saturated if there are too many particles to transport at any given moment. This may be compared to a turnstile at an amusement park, becoming overloaded or saturated with people, increasing the time it takes for the people to get into the amusement park. In the same way, the rate of transport of substances across the membrane may reach a maximum when all the transporters have become saturated. Let's now describe the methods by which solutes or small molecules cross the membrane. The first method is simple diffusion and is utilized by hydrophobic or lipophilic molecules. Since the plasma membrane is hydrophobic, these hydrophobic substances don't need a, ch a channel or carrier protein. They just go down their concentration gradient and pass directly through the membrane. Examples include oxygen or carbon dioxide molecules entering or exiting the cell through the membrane. Testosterone or estrogen are other hydrophobic molecules that are transported in this manner. The next method is facilitated diffusion. Unlike simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion involves a transport protein that allows hydrophilic molecules to go from high to low down their gradient. Potassium ions going from high to low through the potassium leak channels is an example of this type of transport. The next method is primary active transport and involves pumping solutes against their concentration gradient or from low to high. Pumping from low to high requires the energy to be supplied. A good example of primary active transport is the sodium-potassium ATP pump, also called the sodium-potassium ATPase. This carrier pumps three sodium ions out of the cell for every two potassium ions that it pumps into the cell. For the sodium-potassium pump to move ions from low to high, energy in the form of ATP is required. The final method discussed today is secondary active transport. Secondary active transport involves a symporter, which is two solutes or ions in the same direction, or an antiporter, which is two solutes or ions transported in the opposite direction. Secondary active transport uses the energy of the sodium gradient, which was created by the sodium-potassium pump. Secondary active transport is unique in that it requires energy, but not in the form of ATP directly. One of the substances going from high to low, or down its concentration gradient, provides the energy for the other substance to go from low to high, or against its concentration gradient. 
Let's use an analogy to explain. I grew up watching a TV show called Little House on the Prairie. The father in the show, Charles Ingalls, goes to work at a sawmill. The time period of the show is the 1800s, when there was no electricity or gas-powered engines. The question for you is, where did the power come from to turn the saw blade at the sawmill? Well, it was the water wheel that was turned by flowing water flowing downhill. The water would go from high to low because of gravity and turn a wheel that was connected to the saw by a series of pulleys, effectively causing the saw to turn and cut the lumber. This can be compared to secondary active transport. Secondary active transport uses sodium going down its gradient, going from high to low, and entering the cell to move, for example, calcium out of the cell. Calcium is moved against its gradient, or low to high, since the calcium is higher outside the cell. The sodium going from high to low is like the water going from high to low down the hill. The sodium essentially provides the power, and calcium going against its gradient is like the saw turning. Calcium going against its gradient and the saw turning are both things that would not happen unless energy is provided. And where does the energy come from? From the water flowing downhill for the saw and from sodium going down its gradient for the secondary active transporter. With secondary active transport, it's always important to remember that one of the solutes is going down its gradient and is providing the energy for the other substance to go against its gradient. Here's a nice example of secondary active transport. Embedded in the membrane of cardiac myocytes, the cells that contract to allow your heart to pump, are sodium potassium pumps, which are examples of primary active transport. Also embedded in the membranes are sodium calcium antiporters, which are examples of secondary active transport. The sodium gradient, or area of high and low, created by the sodium potassium pump, creates a driving force for sodium to come into the cell through the antiporter. This driving force of sodium provides the necessary energy to drive calcium from low to high and leave the cell. A special flower called foxglove contains a compound called digitalis. Digitalis inhibits the sodium potassium pumps in the membrane of cardiac myocytes. Knowing the increased intracellular levels of calcium will increase force of contraction by the cardiac myocytes, what effect do you think exposure of digitalis will have on cardiac myocyte contraction? Will the cells contract with more or less force? Pause the video now as you contemplate your answer. This summary shows the, that inhibition of the sodium potassium pump by digitalis causes a change in the sodium gradient, which in turn decreases the driving force for the sodium calcium antiporter, causing less calcium to leave the cell, and thus causing intracellular levels of calcium to rise. Here are a few questions to assess your understanding. Pause the video now and contemplate your answers. If you answered the following, you are correct. Thanks for watching.